Hello, my name's Gavin and this is Genre Books and today's video is a lover, reluctant nail in the coffin of Rocket Summer. It's the last of the deep dives into pulps and digests that I'm doing as part of this reading event. Rocket Summer, by the way, is a reading event devised by Michael K. Vaughan co-hosted by a number of fantastic people, all linked below. And we are reading classic and vintage science fiction across four weekly prompts. How these prompts are related to my deep dives is that for week one, where we were reading everything up to 1939 or up to 1940, was Thrilling Wonder Stories from 1937. In week two, the 1940s, I did a issue of Planet Stories, issue number six of Planet Stories from 1941. Last week, last week for the 1950s, I did Infinity Science Fiction, the first issue of Infinity Science Fiction. And for this final week, the 1960s, I'm looking at the uh, October 1963 issue of Galaxy magazine. Galaxy magazine um, began publication in 1950 and had a long lifespan continuing uh, until 1980. It had a number of um, editors in that time but I'm going to concentrate on the first two editors. The first editor H.L. Gold is a former pulp and comic book writer. He has some fortune in taking the editorship of Galaxy and is able to attract some talent for two competing reasons. The first is simple. He paid well. The company paid well comparatively to other science fiction magazines. Secondly, and this relies a bit more on anecdotal uh, evidence, is that Galaxy were able to welcome in a number of refugees for want of a better word uh, writers that had fallen out with um, John W Campbell Jr over at his magazine because they couldn't really get on board with the Dianetics program that uh, Campbell was espousing at the time and as a result Galaxy scores some notable successes in printing for example the story The Fireman by Ray Bradbury, which is later expanded into Fahrenheit 451. The Puppet Masters by Robert A. Heinlein. And The Demolished Man from Alfred Bester. As an editor, Gold puts less of a premium on the sort of pulpy adventure of earlier publications. He also sets less store by relying over much on technology and technological explanations. Instead, he encourages, but doesn't dictate, more of a sociological, psychological, satirical bent to some of the stories. And I think we'll probably see that in the stories in the issue I'm looking at today, even though Gold is not the editor by that point. He unfortunately had very poor health and even in the last years of his editorship at Galaxy was helped by a young up and coming um, writer and editor by the name of Fred Pohl. In 1961 Pohl takes over the editorship of Galaxy in his own name entirely. But given the influence he had had prior to that point, this was very much a continuation of um, the style and the timbre of the stories that Galaxy were publishing. But what can be seen as Pohl's editorship progresses is those first inklings that there is 
a new wave in the air, um, even though no one at this point is calling it that. I noted in my last video on Infinity Science Fiction how grown up that magazine, that digest, presented itself in comparison to Planet One, uh, Planet Stories and Thrilling Wonder Stories. Between Infinity and Galaxy, in the eight years between these two publications, the the change is not as pronounced, but it is still a further step towards being a much more serious publication. There is in these pages an article called For Your Information, which is a regular feature from the science department of Galaxy Magazine. Uh, the magazine had a separate distinctive science editor, uh, a man by the name of Willie Lay. There is no letters page. I mean, there wasn't in Infinity, but that was the very first issue. I'm, I'm not entirely, I can't remember whether Infinity ends up with a letters page. I'm in two minds as to whether I approve of the ditching of the reader's page or not. I quite enjoy seeing the feedback in the magazines. I think it does give a sense of community. However, some of the uh, splenetic rantings in, in some of the letters that I read, especially in, in Planet Stories, makes me understand why an editor might wish not to have to engage with that on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. Then, as now, science fiction fans are very difficult to please. I'm sure... H.L. Gold and Frederick Pohl received much correspondence and I suppose in a way it's uh, it's nice that they're able to turn that tap off. Now when someone wants to pass comment um, onto an editor or writer or director or anyone, they end up broadcasting it to the entire world. In a way, it make. In a way, this makes Galaxy seem a little more didactic, but much more cohesive. As with Infinity Magazine, one thing I am missing from Galaxy are the adverts. There are only two adverts in here, not directly linked to the magazine or its sister publication, and that is, I suppose, some kind of link with pulps of yore in that there is a correspondence course this time from the famous writers school and an exhortation to learn the secrets of the universe the unpublished facts of life from the rosicrucians i kind of miss charles atlas but i'm also glad that medical conditions now seem to be treated by doctors and hospitals rather than buy small ads in the back of pulp magazines. So this magazine is more serious but it still at this point retains optimism. It is coincidence that the copy of Galaxy that I'm reading today is one that's published merely weeks before the assassination of JFK and that seismic event does have an impact again on the tone of the writing that follows something that's a little more cynical a little more um, conspiratorial i don't think that everything that comes afterwards is attributable to that one act but like with pearl harbor the implications are wide Afterwards, after both events, America finds itself in a war. And whilst after Pearl Harbor and the eventual involvement of America in the Second World War, that demonstrates itself through um, a very visible patriotism and a clear-cut uni unity of what's right and what's wrong. The involvement in Vietnam 
is anything but. Yes, there is still the patriotism. Yes, there is still support for the troops, but this is much more fragmented. This is not the unified front. The impact that either event has, or the wars that follow, have on science fiction writing are so far down the list of important things as to be negligible. It's just, you know, happens to be what I'm looking at today. But that event has not happened yet, so we're in the last throes of, of you know, some kind of optimism. We've just escaped the Cuban Missile Crisis. The space race is now underway. As typified by uh, the cover of the magazine, which doesn't relate to any of the stories within the magazine. Two astronauts repairing in space a satellite which is orbiting the moon is pretty much on point for the early 1960s. But let's concern ourselves more with what's within the pages. There is what is described as a complete short novel uh, from William Ten. This runs to some 80 pages of double spaced text a few pictures but not many and it is a story called the men in the walls this was uh, later expanded into a full novel by william ten and one of only a few that he ever wrote i spoke about william ten in the infinity science fiction magazine from last week so i won't repeat any of that here it's a touch allegorical it deals with a degenerate human tribe who call themselves mankind there are only 128 members of mankind left and to begin with as you're thrown directly into the story you think that might actually be the case but it turns out mankind is just one tribe of many living in tunnels on the earth hiding from the monsters who have invaded it details a young man's journey into manhood and his involvement in the heresy of getting involved with alien technology there is a little wry amusement here in um what they've taken from contemporary culture and are using as a basis for mythology but there's some serious stuff going on uh in the background it's an enjoyable novella i don't want to give too much away because people may want to read it but it's definitely a story where you can tell how far we've come from the early pulp stories there is no final victorious ending it's much more of a gray area that we end up in after willie lay's site section which is next in the magazine the next story is uh, The Gem Planet, or On The Gem Planet, by Cordwainer Smith. Smith is an interesting character who I will leave for another time. Suffice to say, he is not primarily concerned with science fiction. He is a, a, an expert in a specific kind of oriental studies. He's an expert in psychological warfare. He literally wrote the book on psychological warfare. And under the pen name Cordwainer Smith, he has written some very, very interesting science fiction short stories. Only two novels, I believe, and one of those is a fix-up. But he's probably best known for his novel Nostrilia. And... This story, although it predates that novel, has seems to exist in the same universe. Some characters refer to Northern Australia as being you know, this sort of very particular um, culture back on Earth. But we are definitely getting new wave vibes from this story. Our protagonist is um, an exiled young pretender to the throne of another planet who is going around trying to um, get support 
to get weapons to go back and take his uncle um, to task. He's not getting much joy from the um, hereditary dictator of the gem planet. Nor is he getting an uh, entirely straight answer from this benevolent dictator's, or seemingly benevolent dictator's niece, who it turns out is actually the uh, the ruler of the planet. The planet, this gem planet, has a very different makeup to how you or I would understand planets. There doesn't just seem to be any soil. They have mineral wealth, and gemstone wealth in abundance, but they even have to import air, so they seem to be perpetually pleading poverty. A hermit, someone from another planet, has recently died, and when they go to investigate um, his house, they find a horse. They have no idea what a horse is, how to deal with a horse. The horse is trying to get out of the valley, the valley of gemstones that it is in, um, with the aid of um, some oxygen tanks which have been strapped to it. The automated um, drone which goes to investigate tries to establish communication, not realising that this is a horse. And our protagonist is brought in to see what he can do about the situation. There are telepaths on the planet and he manages to telepathically communicate with the horse. And much store is set by how he resolves this issue as to whether he is going to get support. So he is fully invested in the problem. I realise how silly this pressy sounds, but it's a, it's a good story. Um, if very idiosyncratic in case i hadn't mentioned the horse is technically immortal so um the immediate solution to relieve the horse's suffering is not available there is then a book review and a number of uh, edgar rice burroughs books are put through the paces this was a time where his john carter novels his venus novels and some of the Tarzan novels are getting their first proper reprints. And you can certainly feel the enthusiasm that the reviewer has in being able to sort of pass this secret, this the books he's grown up with, to this new audience. Then there is another story, and it is H. Chandler Elliott's uh, A Day on the Death Highway. H. Chandler Elliott did not make his money by writing. He was a physician and he was a lecturer in neuroatonomy at the University of Nebraska. Writing was very much a, 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 a hobby. He did, however, write for Galaxy and for Beyond Fantasy Fiction, which is Galaxy's sister magazine dealing with fantasy, and also for um, uh, Astounding magazine. He did have one novel. Reprieve from Paradise, which was published by the Noma Press in, I think, 1955. This is another odd story. It deals with a family, the father of which is a bit of a hothead, a daughter that takes after him, and a more level-headed son, and a long-suffering wife. The man of the house is a travelling salesman, but he's just had his driving licence revoked. So opts to move the family via a, an interdimensional uh, shift, which uproots their entire house and posits them on another planet or another dimension to a place where traffic laws, he has been told, do not exist. He thinks that sounds like paradise, but it's not strictly true. Yes, the rules aren't written down but there definitely is convention and everyone seems to want to drive even more safely because their way of resolving differences once there has been a automobile accident um, is to fight it out in the arena this is therefore a dimension hopping 
family centric Mad Max style beyond Thunderdome telling of a different way of looking at traffic. I'm not entirely sure what the message of the story is, but it's you know it's it's a fun read. The language perhaps is a little too self-consciously hip and modern but at least you know it's something trying to appeal to a, a, a bit more of a modern audience this feels very much like um more like dragster racing than it does science fiction but with a a, you know, a dose of dystopian um society thrown in for good measure the next story is sweet tooth by robert f young this also deals with automobiles but it deals with them in a very different manner a meteor what appears to be a meteor or a falling star as it has been described has landed somewhere in middle america out of this two metallic monsters have emerged and proceed to eat cars a journalist is dispatched to investigate and on the road is waylaid and barely escapes these monsters who proceed to tear his hot rod apart he makes his way into town the local law enforcement is propping the bar up and has already called in the military. They are able to get close to investigate purely because the uh, the local law enforcement drives a, a Model T Ford and the monsters don't seem very much interested in ingesting that. But their attention is diverted, um, especially when the general from the military turns up to do a preliminary investigation in his Cadillac. This was a very well written story he has a nice style about him two years after this magazine young wins a hugo award for a story called little dog gone um, he is compared by some for his poetic turn of phrase to sturgeon or bradbury and in a 30-year career he wrote for startling stories galaxy magazine um saturday evening post Collier's magazine, Playboy magazine, amazing stories, fantastic stories. But he was always a fairly enigmatic figure. No one knew who Robert F. Young was until nearly the end of his, um, well, the end of his life. We did a few interviews and people learned that, you know, whilst he'd been writing uh, for all his magazines, his day job had been as a school janitor. Uh, in New York State a job he'd had since um, his discharge at the end of the Second World War he's not a well remembered name but he does crop up in compilations of magazines and you know, if you see one I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd advise to read it because yeah, it's very well done and then we come to the last story the last story of the magazine and the last story reviewed from a digest or a pulp for rocket summer and that is med shipman by murray leinster and i think it's very apposite that we end with murray leinster it wasn't a conscious choice this is pure serendipity leinster is a survivor of the pulps he's a survivor of the era of campbell he adapts He's versatile, as well as, although he's known best for his science fiction, he was also a detective story writer, an adventure story writer, um, a jungle story writer, a romance story writer. He was just a pulp writer, but he's incredibly prolific and incredibly adaptable. And although he was able to adapt to all these different genres he was also able to adapt to change his first science fiction story was printed in 44 years before his story in this magazine his first science fiction story was 
published in Argosy in 1919, The Runaway Skyscraper. And by 1963, he had been around for a very long time, was a very established name, and had scored a few notable um, successes, not only with an endless stream of novels, but also in terms of being science fiction, he was the first or one of the first to utilize parallel universes with his work Sidewise in Time. It was a Leinster story that first gave the idea of the universal translator, which has since saved no end of exposition in science fiction circles. Nor did this inventiveness confine itself to the pages. He was also an inventor. Under his own name, Murray Leinster is a pen name, under his own name he patented a form of front screen projection for use in special effects in films and TV. He also wrote for TV, also had works adapted for TV. Generally, he was a very busy man. The story Med Shipman deals with Calhoun, who works for a medical ship. He's pretty much on his own on this medical ship, except for his um, pet alien, Murgatroyd, who doesn't say much, but gives him you know a, a fair amount of help. He's in orbit around uh, a planet, and he's trying to get in contact with them, and he's getting no answer. A space liner with wealthy passengers and cargo, has also been in orbit for 12 hours, also unable to raise anybody on the ground. Our protagonist goes to investigate and finds that the entire city, which he'd been due to visit and do a health checkup on, has vanished. Um, he's reminded of the Mary Celeste. People have upped and left their, um, their meals, what seems to be sort of two, three days before. And the story is him tracking uh, um, and to find out exactly what has happened. He's joined in this by Murgatroyd and by one of the passengers of the um, liner who cannot wait to see if there's going to be some kind of quarantine and who lands on the planet with a suitcase full of money. That's the premise of the story anyway. Um, I won't go too much into to what happens next. But I would say that having read some Leinster from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, he is now at this point in the 60s a better writer than he had been and shows a, a nice deftness of touch um, and good mix of sort of wonder and action. But he has a point to make as well. And that's it. That's the end of the magazine. There is nothing more. Like I said, this may come across as a bit more didactic, a little more dry than the previous magazines, but it's also not trying to be your friend. It's just trying to impress you with the stories. It's not making any excuses. It's not publishing the criticism that it was doubtless receiving. And Rocket Summer has allowed me to have that sort of peek into the future that might await me in the era of the Digest. For next time, I'll be returning to the comfortable, musty pages of the pulp magazines and Planet Stories, with issue 7 of Planet Stories and a full deep dive uh, to that particular issue. Until then, 